So it's been nearly five years since the publication of my research article um, in which I um, surveyed parents. It's a parent report. Um, and today I'll provide a brief retrospective. But first, I'd like to share what my values are. Um, one, I'm pro-LGBT. Two, I am pro promoting the health and well-being of all people who experience gender dysphoria. And this means people who desist, people who persist, people who transition, and people who detransition. And um, I do think that the big picture of all of the people who have been affected by gender dysphoria is often lost in this, in this discussion. And I am pro in order to help people we need to ask research questions so that we can better understand conditions, especially if they appear different from conditions um, as we have seen them in the past. So what is ROGD? Rapid onset gender dysphoria, or ROGD, is a term that I created when I first started to study this. I needed a shorter term um, to describe a phenomenon where adolescents or young adults who did not have so sufficient signs of gender dysphoria during their childhoods began to first exhibit these signs during or after puberty. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is controversial. Um, as you've heard, as you've experienced, there are people who are very strongly opposed to the very concept. And whether it should be controversial and whether the opposition might stem from perhaps wanting to tightly control a narrative that is used to justify fast-tracking transition is another discussion that we may have at another time. So in 2018, I published this uh, research article and there were three main hypotheses to emerge from it. One is that this late onset of gender dysphoria occurring um, in today's cohort um, may be a new developmental pathway to gender dysphoria. Two, that social influences, including social contagion, social media, peer contagion, um, et cetera, may contribute to the development of gender dysphoria in some individuals. And that for some people, that the gender dysphoria and transgender identification may represent maladaptive coping mechanisms for other stressors that could include mental health conditions, trauma, difficulty um, accepting oneself as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So after publication, immediately after publication, I received emails from clinicians around the world telling me that they were seeing this in their, in their patient populations and thanking me for the research. So this does appear to be a broader phenomenon than occurring in just my little tiny state in, uh, in the United States. Also immediately, it appears that this research may have touched a nerve. Um, and there was a very strong and forceful and immediate pushback, um, which does continue to this day. Um, at the time that the, the research was published, I was already engaged in doing the first research project I have on detransition. And that research started to shed some light on the process of detransition and on detransitioners. Um, and also that research started to shed some light on the nature of gender dysphoria because hearing from individuals who were gender dysphoric, who did identify as trans, and then no longer identified as, as transgender, um, really provides important context for the, for the whole phenomenon. I have to say, I love that the name of this conference is The Bigger Picture. Um, and as such, I created this slide to illustrate the bigger picture of gender dysphoria. And even this, even though it's a little bit complicated looking, is an oversimplification. But briefly, there are different typologies of gender dysphoria um, as people kind of develop gender dysphoria, um, and there could be different contexts that are not listed. And once someone has gender dysphoria, they may desist or they may persist. 
And if someone is gender dysphoric, they may choose not to transition or they may choose to transition. And of those who transition, some will be satisfied with their transition and stay transitioned. Some will be satisfied with their transition and then due to external reasons like um, complications from the medications or discrimination may detransition. But then also some people may be dissatisfied with their transition and then detransition or they may stay trans transitioned. And again, I think that this larger picture is often lost in our conversations about gender dysphoria. So I will mostly be talking about the first detransition study that I did on this topic. And this was to describe a population of individuals who, as I defined in this study, had medically transitioned and then medically detransitioned. This was an exploratory study anonymous surveys, I collaborated with two individuals who had detransitioned, um, and they helped to create the survey and helped with recruitment. Um, this study is unique in this space, um, or let's just say it's rare, because I reached out to communities with different views on the topic. So in addition to um, posting information on the WPATH listserv, where people are expect, one would expect are strongly pro-transition. We also listed information in DTRANS forums where people may be less unifer, uniformly in belief that um, transition is always beneficial. And for this study, we had 100 participants I did not have an upper age limit, so the range of ages were from 18 to over the age of 60. The population was mostly female, 69% female, 31% male, um, predominantly from the United States, but also from the UK and Canada, and predominantly white. The female detransitioners were different than the male detransitioners in that they were younger when at the time of the survey, but they were younger when they transitioned, younger when they detransitioned. So age 20, then age 23, approximately the mean um, age, um, when they detransitioned and they remained transitioned for a shorter period of time. Um, they also transitioned more recently. So this cohort may actually represent this newer cohort of young female individuals that we're seeing. The females were also more likely to have felt pressured to transition and were more likely to have experienced the trauma within one year of first becoming gender dysphoric. Uh, one point that came up as criticism um, of the ROGD paper was, oh, they, the, they must have always had gender dysphoria from the time that they were young children. They just, the parents didn't notice, they didn't say anything. Well, these were firsthand reports and so it was about half and half of, of individuals who said that their gender dysphoria began during or after puberty versus um, during childhood. And then approximately half had psychiatric diagnoses that occurred before they started to experience gender dysphoria, which makes minority stress an unlikely reason for these psychiatric diagnoses. The most common steps for transition were cross-sex hormones, and the most common step for detransition was stopping cross-sex hormones, and about a third of the female detransitioners had had mastectomy. At the time that individuals started their transition, they uh, identified as transgender, non-binary, or both, and then at the time of the survey, 61% had return to identifying with their birth sex, with um, smaller numbers identifying as non-binary and even smaller numbers continue to identify as transgender. There were a variety of reasons for transitioning that I will give you a moment to read my very busy slide here. And there were a variety of reasons for detransition. <laughs> All right, I guess I didn't give you enough time to read. <laughs> And I'm actually trying to, to uh, <laughs> not, not have anybody notice that I can't read my own <laughs> here. But, you know, for the reasons for transition, people thought that 
transition was the only option to feel better. Their body felt wrong the way it was. Um, and they um, thought they would become their true, true self. And reasons for detransition, the most common reason was that their personal definition of male and female changed and they became comfortable identifying as their birth sex. Um, some people had concerns about medical complications. Some people experienced that their mental health uh, did not improve with transition or even worsened. Um, and some people found or felt that their gender dysphoria was caused by an underlying condition such as a mental health condition or trauma. And there were also people who detransitioned because they had been discriminated against or had fi financial issues. There were several items uh, that came up in the study results that, that supported social influences being involved um, in the process. So in one question, um, we asked participants how they feel now about having identified as trans in the past, and more than a third said that someone told them that the experiences they were having meant that they were transgender and they believed them. And so this speaks to the role of a social influence in how a person interprets their own feelings and experiences and comes to the conclusion that, uh, that they are trans. Um, there were individuals who felt pressured to transition and 20% indicated a particular person or group of people that, that they felt pressured by. And this included clinicians, partners, friends, online communities. Um, there were some friend group behaviors that were identified in the parent report where friend groups actively mocked individuals who were not trans. And so a small subset of these detransitioners de had also experienced this. Um, and then there were a variety of social um, sources that were involved in encouraging participants to believe that transition would help them. And these included YouTube transition videos, blogs, Tumblr, online communities, which not so surprisingly were also identified by parents when, when parents were asked in the previous study what they believe contributed to their child becoming gender dysphoric. So the experiences of this study were categorized in these into these different transition and detransition narratives. So individuals could have more than one um, narrative, so these numbers do not add up to 100%. But they did fall into categories of gender dysphoria was caused by a trauma or mental health condition. Um, that was about 58% and internalized homophobia, difficulty accepting themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, leading to transition, 23%. And this was, this was very interesting because at the time, I did not have a question about, about homophobia in the survey. This, was, this came from um, open text answers of you know, why you transitioned and why you detransitioned other. And, so, and other open texts that people wrote about that. And so for this, the transition and the gender dysphoria was fueled by this internalized homophobia and then accepting themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual is what led to detransition. Um, so 29% um, fell into a discrimination external pressures narrative, 20% fell into social influence by a particular person or group. And then there was a non-binary narrative where an individual either was non-binary at the start of transition and then stopped when they got their desired effects, or a person who started to transition and then came to adopt a non-binary identification. Some um, had a misogyny um, experience some retransition. So I'm just going to give you some examples about what kind of quotes fell into those. Um, and so for the first one, I am not going to be able to read this. So I'll go, go a little closer. I was deeply uncomfortable with my secondary sex character characteristics, which I now understand was a result of childhood trauma and associating my sex characteristics with those events. 
And for the LGB, the difficulty accepting oneself, this quote fell into that transitioning to male would mean that my attraction to girls would be normal. Um, so individuals to transition interacted with mental health and medical professionals. And these were the, what they reported back was that more than half of them felt that the evaluation they received before transition was not adequate. More than half um, reported that their clinicians did not rule out underlying conditions before transition. Nearly half felt that the, the information they received from their um, providers were overly positive about the benefits of transition, and less than a quarter informed the clinicians that facilitated the transition um, that they had detransitioned. So, you know, so when we hear individuals and professionals who are facilitating transition say, "Oh, I never see detransitioners. I only see very few of them," they can be partly right because many of these um, individuals are not going back and not telling them. Uh, so. Well, there were questions about, um, about regret, about satisfaction. Regret was very common, and 50% of individuals had strong or very strong regrets about their transition. The majority were dissatisfied with their decision to transition, and the majority were satisfied with their decision to detransition. Um, again, it was a mix. So there's no one story that fits everyone, by the, by the way. So um, there are just a lot of different experiences, but these are just some, the findings from this, from this study, shedding a little bit of light. And the majority um, were asked that if they knew then what they know now, would they have transitioned? And the majority said no. All right, in conclusion, the reasons and experiences around transition and detransition are diverse. Information from detransitioners informs our understanding of gender dysphoria. And there are some really um, important ones, I think, which are that gender dysphoria can be temporary. You know, we talk about trans and gender dysphoria as if this is a permanent, permanent um, aspect of a person. And what we're hearing from detransitioners and from desisters is that this can be temporary. Um, it is also possible that transition can worsen one's mental health. And the other thing that's important to, to remember is that individuals can misinterpret their own feelings and experiences. Um, the findings from this study supported um, several of the findings from the ROGD study, um, which is important because these are firsthand accounts of in asking individuals about their own experiences instead of parents. So the late onset that first began in adolescence or young adulthood, psychiatric conditions predating the gender dysphoria, um, reporting that mental health, trauma, um, other stressors, were underlying conditions for gender dysphoria, and the particular social influences that people acknowledged were part of their experience. So where do we go from here? There are a few studies and projects that are in the works. Um, we have one project of um, desisters and detransitioners. Uh, this is a little bit different. This was not an anonymous survey. It started as an anonymous survey, but there was a sabotage attempt where um, individuals tried to um, invite everybody to take the survey and put in um, false answers. So, so this study actually, we had to increase security and do video interviews of, in, of um, participants before allowing them into the study. And so for this project, we looked at um, individuals 18 to 33 years of age. So it's a narrower scope. It's a cohort that became teenagers after WPATH SOC7 when the requirements became more lax. It's a, a cohort that 
experienced social media growing up. Um, and we asked them not just about factors associated with becoming trans-identified and becoming not trans-identified. We asked them to rate them in importance. And so this is a paper that is currently undergoing peer review, um, but there is more data to be gleaned from this um, there is a question about why detransitioners did not return to the clinics to, to tell them. So um, there's just a lot there that we can actually um, get some great information from. Um, also, there is uh, a study that um, has been in the planning stages for a while with Dr. Ken Zucker, Dr. Mike Bailey, and myself, where we are going to launch a large international study that follows gender dysphoric youth and their parents for at least five years. And we are going to look at outcomes. We're going to look at mental health outcomes. And thanks. Thank you. And we're going to look at family uh, relationships. Um, so this is very exciting, but we can't do this research without you. Um, so I'm going to, so I'm going to, to say that if you would like to support um, these research efforts, please go to our web to the website. So this is my nonprofit organization. Um, you can go to the website. Um, if you have friends that happen to be billionaires or whatever, um, you know, you can you can share the, the website with them, or you can you can contact me, talk to me. Um, you know, we would love to have funding to hire someone to help with the recruitment. As I've learned from this from the past study, we can't just put out an anonymous survey because there are people who don't want this research to happen. So if we could hire an individual as a research assistant to help with our screening, um, that will allow this process to go faster and more efficiently. So that would be, that would be amazing uh, because there is so much more research that needs to be done in this area. Um, cancellation is always a risk. And so finding um, professionals who can do this work, um, you know, is really important, as well as finding, you know, what I would call alternative funding sources, um, because in some areas, this is an unpop, it is unpopular to take the big picture approach. So with that, I'll close. Thank you.